Welcome to Nursing Care of COVID Patients. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. This is part two, our prompt action to decrease complications in COVID patients. So let's talk a little bit for review about what COVID is. So you can see this big wheel on the left over here. COVID is a virus and it's related to a lot of other viruses that we're very familiar with. We're very familiar with the common cold. We're very familiar with COVID-2, which or COVID, uh, coronavirus 2, which was uh, around quite a while ago, and a lot of other viruses that we come in contact with. So you can see that there's kind of a uh, whole diagram here of different virus classes that are all related to COVID-2. However, some of those, like the common cold, don't produce the kind of symptoms that we see with our coronavirus that we're dealing with right now. So let's talk about how it attacks the body. First of all, the virus will first usually attack the lungs because it is a respiratory transmission. And so it goes down into the lungs, it gets uh, causes some damage directly to the lung tissue itself, and then it gets into the bloodstream. And from there, it can travel throughout the entire body. So it goes to the cardiovascular system, the neuromuscular system, including the brain itself, the gastrointestinal system, and the liver and the kidneys. In addition to the damage that's being caused by the virus itself, we also have some secondary damage that may be caused by some of the treatments that we're using in order to be able to stabilize and maintain our patient. So let's talk about how we're going to find some of these early signs of distress and then what we're going to do to try to prevent complications in these patients. One of the earliest signs we're going to see that a patient is having difficulty with managing their respirations and managing their air and CO2 removal and the air, the oxygen input into the body is going to be through using a FiO2 or a PO2 FiO2 ratio, which is also called a PF ratio. This PF ratio tells us how well the oxygen, the PO2, is getting into the bloodstream. So when we're giving our patient oxygen, that's the FiO2 part. So when we're looking at this diagram over on the right, and you see here's the alveolus, and you see the blood flow around the alveolus, the oxygen that is in that alveolus that's coming from outside is the FiO2. So that's our fraction of inspired oxygen. We measure that out at the nose or mouth or wherever device it is that we're using to give oxygen to the patient because we really can't stick something all the way down there into the alveolus to be able to check and see how much oxygen is down there. So you may say that a patient is on a 100% FiO2. By the time that oxygen gets all the way down to the alveolus, it's probably a little less than 100% uh, because we're mixing with air that's already in the lung. But we're going to assume that what we're giving at the airway is going to be the FiO2 or is going to be the amount of oxygen that's down there in the alveolus. Now the second piece that we're going to take here is the PO2. The PO2 is the uh, the partial pressure of oxygen that's in the arterial blood. So we're going to get a blood gas and we're going to look at the PO2. The PO2 is how much oxygen has actually crossed that alveolar membrane and gotten into the arterial circulation. So now what we're assessing is that alveolar capillary membrane because we're looking at how much oxygen is in the alveolus and how much oxygen is in the artery. So that tells us how much of it got across that alveolar capillary membrane and is circulating the bloodstream. So we're going to take this equation, this example here, and we have a PO2 of 80 and we have an FiO2 of 40%. So let's say the patient is on a 40% Venny mask. And we measure with our blood gas that the patient has a PO2 of 80. Now we put it into the equation, the PO2 comes first, so 80, and we're gonna divide that by the FiO2. The FiO2 is in a percentage, we need to put that into a decimal so we can do our division. And so the decimal for 40% is 0.4 or 0 0.40. So we divide that out. So 80 divided by 0.4 equals 200. Keep in mind whenever you're doing this equation that the number you come up with should be larger than the numbers you started with. So if you start with a PO2 of 80, we ended up with a PO2 FiO2 ratio of 200, see how the number's bigger, because we're dividing by a decimal. Normal is greater than 300. 
So you can see that in this equation here, even though these numbers may have looked okay, we get our blood gas back, the PO2 of 80, that falls on the very low end of the normal range, but it's in the normal range. So it may not be alarming to you. You put a pulse ox on a patient's finger with a PO2 of 80, he could have a very normal pulse ox as well. So we're not seeing any overt symptoms here other than the fact that we have a low PO2 FO2 ratio, which is telling us we're having a hard time getting that oxygen from the alveolus down in into the pulmonary capillaries. Other associated symptoms that often come with this decrease in PO2 FIL2 ratio are subjective dyspnea. The patient's telling you, I feel like I can't catch my breath. Now, oftentimes this is not associated with a, an extremely fast respiratory rate or other symptoms that you see outwardly, but the patient feels like they can't catch their breath. And there could be a slight increase in respiratory rate. Now, I say slight, that doesn't mean it has to be 40, you know, it could be that the patient's respiratory rate went from 20 up to 24, 26. We can also take a look at the chest x-ray, and what you see over here on the right is a patient who has COVID infection. And we have this whiteout on the chest x-ray, so those lung areas there should be really nice and dark because they're filled with air, so they should be nice and dark. And now what we're seeing is a lot of white on that chest x-ray. This is a diffuse pulmonary edema. This is very common in patients who have ARDS and in our patients who have COVID-19. We'll also start to see some fibrosis. The fibrosis is going to form a little bit later in the disease process, but these are the things we're looking for when we're looking to diagnose COVID in a patient's chest x-ray. Other associated symptoms, well, if we've got all of this diffuse pulmonary edema, we're gonna hear rowels, or what is also called fine crackles, throughout the lungs. Now that's different than what you hear in a patient who has cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where they form in the bases and they work their way up. We'll also see some sputum production. Okay, so there we have this inflammation that's occurring, and the inflammation is around the lungs, so it's in the interstitial spaces, but it's also in the airways itself, so that's going to cause sputum production. We'll see fever, and we'll see an increase in respiratory rate. Our prompt action then will be deep breathing, deep coughing, so have that patient take some really nice deep breaths and deep coughing to try and move some of those secretions along, huff breathing, chest percussion, turning and positioning. We want to let gravity help here and in fact in many of our patients who have COVID we will put them into the prone position to help with drainage. Elevating the head of the bed, oxygen for saturation less than 92. We may use high flow nasal cannula especially in patients who are exhibiting signs of respiratory failure. If the patient needs to be intubated and ventilated we're going to use a low tidal volume strategy so rather than using a higher tidal volume in the range of 8 to 10 milliliters per kilogram, we're going to use a lower tidal volume strategy, 5 to 6 milliliters per kilogram. This is a pretty common practice anymore with mechanical ventilation just because it causes less barotrauma in all of our patients. In some patients who are not responsive, we may use ECMO, that's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Basically, it's like bedside dialysis, except that we're pulling out CO2 and adding oxygen instead of pulling off some of those waste products that you do with dialysis. I mentioned prone positioning. Prone positioning, we actually put the patient in the prone position, so that's the pictures you're seeing over to the right when we put them in that prone position. It increases the amount of oxygen, and there's a couple reasons why. First of all, if you notice the person in the supine position, all of those internal organs, including the heart, are pressing down on the lungs because the lungs are posterior. So the lungs are sitting posterior, they're collecting a lot of fluid in the posterior area, and we have the pressure of the heart on them. Now we flip that patient over into the prone position and the heart moves forward off of the lungs and it allows the lungs to expand a little bit better. At the same time, it can also help to, by gravity to move some of those secretions down toward the front now of the lung and hopefully get those mobilized. A typical schedule for prone position is either putting the patient in the prone position for 16 hours, then flipping them back on their back for 8 hours, or a 4 to 1 schedule where they're 4 hours in the prone position, 1 hour in the supine position. So these are some typical types of schedules that we would use with prone positioning. It is associated with improved mortality. However, there are a lot of complications that we don't normally assume that our patient is going to have. 
primary of which is skin breakdown. Notice the patient in the prone position here. He's laying on the side of his face. In fact, could be laying on his eyes, and the prone position for a long period of time could cause blindness if we're not patting our patient correctly. We can also get some skin breakdown on the fronts of the shoulders, the hips, the knees, the legs, etc., in places that we don't normally see it. So we want to pad the, the patient appropriately. We want to make sure that we're moving the patient's joints so that the arms and legs are not in a, a position all the time where they could be causing joint and nerve dysfunction. Muscle weakness can also occur. Of course, it could occur in the patient in the supine position for a long period of time, too. We can also have some postural imbalance disorders that result as a result of having that patient in the prone position for a long period of time. Of course, one of the situations we have to be concerned with, with any patient who has an infection, is the possibility of sepsis and septic shock. And in fact, COVID-19 can cause the patient to develop sepsis and septic shock. As that virus moves out of the lung and into the bloodstream, we're going to start to have these complications that are part of the inflammatory response. Now, when we talk about sepsis and septic shock, we're talking about an overwhelming out-of-control inflammatory response that is going to be evidenced by vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting. So these are the three main things that are going to happen with sepsis and septic shock. And in fact, they happen with COVID as well. The vasodilation is going to cause an initial decrease in blood pressure, specifically the diastolic blood pressure. Diastolic is a function of the vasculature, and we're going to see a decrease in the diastolic pressure and possibly a labile temperature as the patient struggles to maintain a temperature or fever to fight off this, this virus. Next, we'll see some capillary permeability. This is where the edema comes from. So I've mentioned that there's pulmonary edema. We saw the chest x-ray with all that scattered pulmonary edema. It's the result of having capillary permeability as part of this inflammatory response. Lastly, there's clotting. And you may have heard of patients who have COVID developing either venous thromboemboli, DIC, pulmonary emboli, etc., as a result of this clotting process that occurs as part of the component of inflammation. So our prompt action will be to monitor dynamic parameters in our patients, such as skin temperature, capillary refill, lactate level. These are going to tell us more about what's going on with the patient's perfusion. Use a conservative fluid management strategy, and they're recommending lactated ringers uh, as a as a fluid instead of using normal saline in these patients who have COVID sepsis. We're trying to avoid albumin, dextran, hespan. All of these listed here have been associated with poorer outcomes in our patient who has COVID sepsis. Norepinephrine for shock and titrate to a mean arterial pressure of around 60 so that hopefully we are perfusing all those vital organs. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Care of COVID Patients Part 2, Prompt Action to Decrease Complications. I'd like to invite you to check out the CCRN Certification Coach. If you're interested in becoming a Certified Critical Care Nurse, CCRN, from the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, make sure you check out our program. It is guaranteed that you will pass the exam with test-taking tips, study strategies, and an online program that is bound to help you to understand all the concepts and to be able to pass the exam. Check us out online at thenursingprof.com. Thanks again for joining me. Until next time, bye now.